I walk a straight line, shackle and chain. Oh, gruesome Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango. Hey everyone and welcome back to Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. Bloody Angola is going to be fire, fire for the fire, next fire, several fire, episodes. Fire, right. And it's unique. It's a hell of a story. Jim's uh, done all the research on it and everything else. And we have a, a well, we'll look. Don't let the cat out. <laughs> but, we'll tease it uh, throughout we'll tease the it, series. Tease it but. throughout. Um, but this is super, super interesting uh, and, and directly relates to Bloody Angola because the guy was sentenced to Bloody Angola. Yeah, he was. And, and, and we're going to get into all that. And before we get into kind of the facts of this case, and we're limited to what we can tell you until we get to that particular part of the story because right. this story has a, a ton of of twists and turns. Um, It's going to be an interesting look at the judicial system uh, from both sides and, and just a fair, honest look. Um, But it's a crime. It's a, it's a, uh, you know, what was based on a horrific crime um, that you're going to want to hear about. And so we're going to start off this one with the facts of the case and what actually occurred. So on September 11th of 2003, a lady by the name of Audra Bland was consuming alcohol with a guy by the name of William Wayne Lee Jr. and some friends at a Mississippi casino called the Beau Rivage. And for those of you that aren't from the deep south like we are, uh, the Beau Rivage is on the Gulf Coast right. in Mississippi. It's the nicest casino, uh, in my opinion. That's where uh, my wife and I go all the time. Uh, and um, it's actually an MGM property. It's yeah. the only one in in South Mississippi that is tied to, to, to all the MGM resorts. Have, have They have a lot of, uh, of, of music stars that go right, there. Right, and yeah, and they're, so they're, it's a very popular and, destination. And, and very very high end retail shopping, like kind of, it's like Vegas in South Mississippi. That's right, and and uh, very convenient for like where where we're recording at is what would you say two, about two, two hours, hours two, two hour hours drive, times. and it feels like you're you know in a whole nother world. Right, right. Uh, when you go there, you can get pampered and all those sorts of things. So popular destination and very common for people from this area uh, to visit. And this case is actually from this area. Uh, Miss Bland was married, and she was having an a what you would say is an extramarital uh, affair with William Wayne Lee Jr. Now, at one point during the night, Lee Jr. got visibly upset with Miss Bland, and uh, she was dancing with somebody else. Basically, right, right. he got upset about this. However. You know, there's a lot of alcohol being passed around. People are getting drunk. You get mad, then you're not right, mad right, anymore. Right. You love each other again and all those sorts of things. But that night of drinking continued until about daybreak. And at daybreak, the group, it was just a group of friends all together. They decided to relocate to a large lake house, which was owned by Lee Jr.'s mother and stepfather. Right. And so y'all um, at approximately 9 p.m., uh, Lee Jr. began screaming for help because Miss Bland, 
who he thought was sleeping off a hangover, wasn't breathing. And the friends staying at the house with them, who were James Morse and Leah Castagna and Josh Gilliatt, said that Lee Jr.'s scream sounded genuine and that Lee Jr. was so upset, he began banging his fist on the floor while screaming and yelling. So uh, Castagna began performing mouth-to-mouth on Miss Bland, who was naked at the time, but did not smell or taste of alcohol. And the, y'all, they called 911, and when the EMTs arrived on the scene, she was still unconscious and had no heart or body movements, basically, motor yeah. activity. Yeah, and, you know, it's important. We're going to be giving you some facts here that you're going to want to keep in mind throughout this story. For example, uh, one of the gentlemen tried to give mouth to mouth to her and he noted that he didn't smell or taste out. Now she had been drinking, but uh, I think the point he was getting at was it, you know, he didn't notice that that was still in her system. Um, when it, when it first started and Lee Jr. calls nine one one. He's bang. He's screaming. He's banging his fist on the on the floor. Let, and let's go, let's go back and make it clear for you. They they got back to to the lake house around daybreak, right after partying all night. This is nine p.m. the so following many day. hours. Yeah, later, like twelve hours or however many hours later. That's right, because they probably didn't get to bed until right. you know eight o'clock in the morning. Right. Uh, and you're going to sleep your eight hours, whatever. Her body was first examined at 10.53 p.m. So uh, lividity was present, but it was not fixed. And when I asked Woody a couple right. questions after I get done with this statement, uh, but was not fixed, indicating that she had been dead for 6 to 12 hours. Right. During the 911 call and to the St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's Office investigators, Lee Jr. gave his side of the chain of events leading up to the death. Lee Jr. stated uh, to 911 that the victim had fallen down drunk and bumped her head after the group returned from the casinos in Mississippi. So before we go any further, uh, talk about lividity for a second. Lividity is when you die, your body goes actually goes to like three different stages of lividity. But um, so basically your body gets stiff. Yeah. And and like – Literally, you, you know, pick pick them up like a board. Uh, uh, at, at certain stages of it, it'll get st- hard, and it's like like a, a cement person. Or I, don't know, I don't know how wow. to explain it. And then um, as time goes on, it'll it'll loosen up, and then it gets harder, hard again, and it loosens up, and it's just it's what it's what happens. So that's how they'll determine. Yeah, they can determine how how long you've been down for by the stages of lividity. I mean, yeah. yeah. So anyway, y'all, so when Lee uh, Jr. spoke to St. Tammany Sheriff's Office, Sergeant Jerry Hall, uh, who was at the scene, indicated that Miss Bland woke up a few times throughout the day but was incoherent. And he claimed he tried to wake the victim up by giving her a bath at 12.30 p.m. Then at 3 p.m., he tried to wake the victim again and noticed she had vomited. During the conversation with Sergeant Lee, uh, with, with the sergeant, Lee Jr. also indicated that he had given Miss Bland a ring, but she recently had given it back to him. Mm, the and, important. And, and, and she was already married. Right? Yeah. 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 And so, an important facts, you know, that this sergeant who he's not questioning him as if, uh, at this point at least, right. I would imagine uh, he didn't tell Lee Jr. this. He's gathering facts, but he's not letting right. on probably that, hey, we think you had something to yeah, do well, with this. You've got to look at him first. and That's who you always look at who, who found the body first. That's right. And detectives, they, they start doing what detectives do. And that starts with questioning those that were at the scene during the death of Miss Bland, as well as those who were familiar with the relationship between her and Lee Jr. Of course, you're going to you're going to start interviewing all of these people the following day, which was September 13th of 2003. James Morse, one of the friends that was in the house during the event, had a conversation with Lee Jr. regarding what happened. Lee Jr. told Morse that while Miss Bland was trying to get her overnight bag from his vehicle's trunk, she stumbled, fell backwards, and hit her head on the concrete. He went on to tell Morse that she was knocked unconscious but came to rather quickly, and he assisted her up. 
Lee Jr. then said that he suggested Miss Bland go to the hospital to get checked out, but she responded that she would be all right and followed him upstairs into the bedroom. Right. Now that's his story, right? And the well, so the detectives also spoke to uh, Jenny uh, Ward Water, who was one of Bland's sisters, and Miss Water said that just a month prior to her sister's death. They had had a conversation in which Miss Bland stated that she was trying to end her relationship with Lee Jr. And another issue that raised the eyebrows of the Texas was with regard to an article of clothing returned to Jenny by Lee Jr.'s mother. A Tiger Eye t-shirt was sent off for uh, testing, which revealed 16 bloodstains. And the bloodstains matched the DNA of Lee Jr. as well as... DNA taken from uh, Miss Bless Bland's left hand, but not under, but not under, not under her nails, right? Right, right. And and so only Miss Bland's DNA was found under her under her fingernails, under her fingernails, and that's going to be you know keep that in mind, right? It, uh, just for later on. There's a reason we're we're uh, hyper focusing on that right. now. Uh, more interviews with those surrounding Lee Jr. circle took place. And, and Woody, that's, I would imagine, typical. You find a situation like this, you've got a guy saying she fell and hit her head. And that may very well be true. Right. But right. what do you, you know, at that point, or especially with many people having been in that house during this time, yeah. is it kind of like a you, canvassing thing? You're going you're gonna to interview everybody uh, in, in the Depending on what you hear from them, then you go and find other people to interview, like yeah. you know, the mother or, or whomever. So yeah, that's. I mean, you're going to talk to everybody there. That's your job, right? You got to investigate, and you're probably trying to do everything you can to rule this guy out, right? Right. Well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you got to go stay on him until you can rule him out. That, uh, Very good. Miss um, Blaine's daughter was another person they talked to, and she was 12 years old at the time. Now. She didn't have um, very good things to say about Lee Jr. She said that she saw Lee Jr. strike Miss Bland in the face with a hurricane flashlight. What's a hurricane That's flashlight? One of those big uh, uh, black mag lights. Yeah. yeah, heavy, heavy, and can do some damage during an argument in a hot tub. And that after the incident, Miss Bland and her daughter hid from Lee Jr. under the stairs of the house. And then went and hid in her mother's car. Right. So she's establishing right. fear, right? right. And in pattern of abuse, yeah. Yeah. Um, on another occasion, she said she stated she saw Lee Jr. hit Miss Blame while Miss Blame was handcuffed to a bed. Wow, at twelve years old. Twelve years old. A prior fiance of Lee Jr.'s uh, by the name of Stephanie Moore stated that Lee Jr. had a jealous nature. And was controlling as well as having quite a temper. She described his temper his temper as a bomb ready to go off. She broke off her engagement after a year being engaged when Lee Jr. attacked her in her trailer. In that particular incident, Lee Jr. and Moore attended a Mardi Gras parade in Mandeville, Louisiana. Popular right, right next door to basically where the Slake House was. Uh, um and that goes back to at the Beau Rivage. He got jealous because yeah. she was dancing with someone else. So. Great, great point. I yeah. mean, it's showing a pattern, right? I mean, yeah. After the Mardi Gras parade, she went home, um, but Lee Junior left and went to New Orleans. And early the next morning, Lee Junior returned to Moore's trailer, looking to argue. And as soon as he walked in the door, he stated to Miss Moore that he had. Had a lot of fun with a blind girl. Oh, that's going right? to. Like, <laughs> That'll fire up a yeah, fight real quick. Right? And, it, and it did. So Moore told Lee Jr. to get out and kicked him in the leg. Lee Jr. responded by ripping the bed clothes off of Moore, threw her across the room, grabbed her by the hair above the ears, and pounded her head and and to the floor until he became so tired he couldn't do it any longer. Moore stated that she believed Lee Jr. was trying to kill her, during the incident, but just warm out himself out so bad by beating her. He just didn't have the energy uh, to do it, to kill her after being out all night. Jesus Christ. And Literally and wore that, himself yeah. out, and slamming it, her head against again, the floor. This, these are investigators and are now, uh, you know, they can't get off of him. They're looking at his past actions and they're establishing this patterns of him beating on women. 
So Heidi Ackman was all, a friend of Miss Bland's that was also interviewed by police, and she she plays a big part in this story. Right. Miss Ackman stated she had went to a daiquiri store at one point with Bland and Lee Jr. and was present when Miss Bland asked Lee Jr. what why he had never worn some pants that she had bought him. And, you know, they're riding in the car and this topic comes up of pants and she can tell that it's starting to agitate Lee Jr. to say the least. And so they leave this daiquiri store and the couple starts arguing on the way back to his home. And he starts like driving crazy. Y'all he, you know, imagine this, you're driving home with this, this couple, you're a friend of the, of Miss Bland's and they're just fighting. They're arguing. Right. He's calling her a exactly. bitch and all his, yeah. all his stuff. Um, then he starts driving crazy. He's right. swerving all over the road, slamming on the brakes mm. and just yelling and arguing. And at one point during this incident, he slams in brakes, throws everybody forward. He looks at Miss Bland and he tells her, get out of the car. Yeah. Um, but Miss Bland, you know, she's fired up too, and right. she says, "I ain't getting out of the car." And right. and so they argue about that for a little while. She refuses, and they continue on to the house. So right. once they arrive at the house, Lee Junior told Miss Bland to put on a choke collar. Right. Yep, put on a choke collar, and she complied. Now. For those of you that may not be familiar with a, a choke collar and, and sado, I guess sadomasochistic or however they say it, um, it is like a, a collar that the harder you pull on it, the more it's going to tighten. Right. Um, so he tells her to put that choke collar around her neck, and she complied. And you can imagine what Miss Ogman's thinking during right. this. Exactly. Um, but they're, you know, they've been drinking daiquiris. They're probably all buzzing, whatever. Uh, Lee Jr. then started asking Miss Bland questions, and every time she did not get give him the answer that he wanted, he would pull the choke collar tighter. Shortly thereafter, Miss Ackman stated that Lee Jr. and Miss Bland went into the bedroom, where she said she could hear what she would describe as hustling and screaming in the bedroom, and heard Miss Bland ask that Ackman be allowed into the bedroom. So Lee Jr. opens the door and he tells Miss Ackman to come into the bedroom and sit on the bed. He told uh, he basically told Miss Ackman that Bland was being punished. And if Ackman got up to leave, she would get worse punishment than Bland was That's getting. Crazy. So this is what Miss Ackman's telling the police. So Lee Jr. then asked another question to Miss Bland, and when the answer did not satisfy him, he pulled real hard on the choke collar. Miss Bland's face turned palish blue, almost a purple color is how Miss Ottman uh, described it. And Lee Jr. then pushes Miss Bland up against the wall. She strikes her head on the wall, and she kind of slides. Y'all picture this. She slides down that wall slowly onto the floor. Miss Bland then asked Ackman for help, and when pressed by detectives whether she thought that the couple was just playing a sex game, because that's you know what what probably you were thinking at this time, uh, Ackman stated no, she did not think so. That during this incident, Miss Bland cut the back of her head being shoved against the wall, so he didn't just lightly shove her. Yeah, he, slammed he slammed her so hard she cut the back of her head. Miss Ackman did concede, however, that the couple was into dominatrix type stuff, mm. as she described. Plot it. thickens, but they you know, still they're gathering evidence, right? Finding out who this cat really is, right? So Ackman also sheds some light on the story. Um, police heard directly from, from Lee Jr. regarding a ring that Bland had given back to him. She stated on the night Miss Bland died. Uh, Bland was going to a class in Mississippi for a DWI she had gotten. And she mentioned that after the class, her and Lee Jr. were going to go to the casino, but likely it would be the last time they went together as she was considering going back to her husband. Now, Miss Ackman told Miss Bland that if she was going to have this conversation with Lee Jr. to do it in a public place and, and don't go anywhere with him alone. Now, remember, she witnessed this 
bedroom slamming into the wall and the choke collar and all that. Um, so she was afraid for a friend. Miss Bland then asked Miss Ackman to babysit her kids while they went to the Beau Rivage, which Miss Ackman agreed. And then when Miss Bland showed up to drop off the kids, she was wearing the same. Hey, y'all, the holidays are right around the corner, and HelloFresh can help take the stress out of dinner by delivering everything you need to cook up tasty meals right to your door, saving you tons of time. Hosting this holiday, HelloFresh Market has just what you need to please a crowd without the hassle from photo-worthy charcuterie boards to mouth-watering desserts. One of my personal favorites for the holidays is the roast turkey with the side dishes I love. It's less time in the kitchen for me and more time watching football. And with those handy recipe cards, even I can't mess up Thanksgiving. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Bloody Angola Free and use code Bloody Angola Free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Bloody Angola Free with code Bloody Angola Free. HelloFresh, it's America's number one meal kit tiger eye shirt that police had found the 16 blood stains on that uh, was linked back to uh dna to lee jr off. so that's that right. that establishes that the night that she died that she had on the same shirt. she had on the same shirt. yeah so the original plan was that miss bland would pick up the kids around 12 a.m she called Miss Ackman during the evening asked if she could pick up the kids the next day because she was going to go to Lee Jr.'s lake house, and she sounded intoxicated, and Ackman did say she was teetering on becoming a full-blown alcoholic. Mm, so, you know, those are um, important statements because you're not only establishing, you know, throughout this so far, you're establishing Lee Jr.'s, I guess, habit patterns right. and and history when it comes to uh how he treats females right. and and uh and, his, and, his and, attitude and anger problems right and in their their history together yeah yeah, yeah very good point um, and so the police continue on, they're investigating and they talk to someone named Petra Chapman, who is no relation to me. <laughs> I don't know Miss Petra, okay. uh, but was also a friend of Miss Bland's at approximately 1130 PM that same night, she joined the group at the Beau Rivage Casino in Biloxi and she saw Miss Bland and Lee Jr. kissing. And also noticed that Miss Bland was wearing that tiger eye shirt right. that we told you about. Um, she also noticed Miss Bland was wearing a ring. Mm. That's important. Right. So um, at one point during the night, Petra stated she saw Lee Jr. whisper something into Miss Bland's ear. And then he gets up and he leaves the room. And Miss mm. Bland uh, turns to her, y'all, and she basically says, someone is probably upset because I danced with somebody. Right. Yep. Uh, it probably was. And yeah. especially knowing his, no, history, his history now, right. the, that's not a good thing. And everything else, yeah. yeah, so she then tells Petra that Lee Jr. was jealous because she danced with someone else. She right. kind of confirmed that. After Miss Bland, uh, you know, they talked for a little while with, with Miss Chapman, and she states she was hungry. So Petra, she says, hey, you're hungry? I'm I'm hungry, too. And she says, why don't you and Lee Jr. meet me at a bar called Avengers? That Avengers was a bar that also served food. Right. So kind of like a bar and grill. Right. They meet up at that bar, and Petra orders some vodka and orange juice for herself, as well as uh, a, a glass for Lee Jr. and a glass for Miss Bland. She claims that Miss Bland had very little to drink. She didn't appear intoxicated, and she had no noticeable scratches or bruises. So at this point of the night, she had no scratches, no bruises on her face. Didn't look like she had been right. fighting. She claims that she she didn't look like she was she was drinking, but right. she wasn't like falling down drunk or anything right. like that. Um, they right. stay, they eat, and she left the couple and went home around four o'clock that morning. Right. So um, that by her account, you know, she was okay. But uh, uh, but after police had questioned so many witnesses, they then combed through their autopsy report conducted by St. Tammany Parish 
uh, Chief Deputy Coroner Dr. Michael Defada. He classified the cause of death as blunt force head trauma and listed the manner of death as homicide. Miss Bland had a fatal skull fracture and a large bruise in the middle of her forehead. She also had an hours old injury on the middle finger of her of her left hand consistent with a ring being torn from her finger. Remember mm. y'all we told you about the ring earlier. She also had scratch marks on her neck that were only hours old and were most commonly uh, seen when someone had a hand around their neck and was being choked or subdued to some degree. Now, that could, could go back to Dominique's stuff, but we don't know yet. The scratch marks appear to have been caused by fingernails. Uh, he also noted Miss Bland had injuries to her lip, mouth, and nose, and felt the injuries to the to the victim's face were caused by a compression of some type to the face rather than a fall. Basically, my, my, uh, a hand over the face or, or smothering. He noted as well at, uh, that the bruising to the forehead was hours old. And according to the doctor, the skull fracture was consistent with added force such as a push, a punch of some sort, as if someone was on top of her that falls on her as she hits the ground, right? Like you tumble over together. He went on in the report to explain that with an uh, epidural hematoma, one of the two things, one of two things are going to occur. First, the initial impact can cause immediate loss of consciousness, followed by a lucid interval during which an injured person would come back to. That is, until the swelling and bleeding of the brain reaches a critical point, and then the injured would then lose consciousness again, and the brain bleeding would increase. Mm. Right? So basically fucked. <laughs> yeah. And for, but toxicology tests performed with both blood and urine and came back with uh, as being negative. However, depending on the amount of time that the victim survived after the initial impact to her head, the alcohol in her system could have uh, – been processed down in her body to zero, right? So your body processes out like uh, one one drink per hour. But he also examined Lee Jr. three days after the death of Miss Bland, and he found injuries consistent with Lee Jr. having been in a struggle with numerous scratches on his right wrist that were just days old. He, he also had they. Lee also had day-old abrasions on his right forearm, as well as small abrasions on the back of his neck and two scratches behind his right ear. He had small scratches on his face that were in the same line, indicating someone scratched him across the face with fingernails in one fell swoop. So and, they were in the same line. Right, right. Let's see. So that's it looks like, like defensive. Uh, it sounds like defensive wounds to me. Um, yeah, like it, if he was attacking someone, they're, they're Yeah, fighting spot, back, right? yeah. Yeah. So, while the doctor conceded no DNA from Lee Jr. was found under the nails of Miss Bland, he stated that because Lee Jr. put her in the bathtub, his DNA could have been washed away. Mm. Y'all, DNA is not, is not always there. Even if I could scratch you right now, Jim, and I, I may or may not get it. But, yeah. it, 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 it. but if I got it, then you're got, right? But she just didn't have it. So if it was only her DNA. Interesting. Yeah. So as you can see, and you know, before we get any further, it it is absolutely intriguing to me how these medical examiners can just tell all this from yeah. a, a victim, and you know that almost like that victim's telling that story after they after the death, after doing so many autopsies, et cetera. But the autopsy really is you exclude all other causes, and then you focus on. It's kind of like working on a homicide. You, you you exclude, you know, their legs weren't broken, their arms weren't broken, da da da, until you get down to um, the only thing that could have caused the death, which yeah. was a subdural hematoma. Very so. interesting. So, as you can see, the St. Tammany uh, Parish Sheriff's Office and the state of Louisiana put together quite a case. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, they we've talk to all these witnesses they they are establishing a pattern here and kind of the final nail in the coffin for uh the defendant in this case which is lee jr is that uh this this 
uh, evidence comes back or, or the opinion of this medical examiner that is pointing towards a fight. I mean, he's, he's basically saying, uh, I believe that these injuries are consistent with somebody punching somebody, yeah. not somebody right. just falling on the ground. Right. I mean, that's why he listed it as, as a homicide. And 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 Lee Jr. had all these defensive wounds on him. Remember, right. uh, we told you earlier that the lady that ate, ate, ate that late dinner with them and had that one drink with them said she saw no injuries right. on right. on uh, on the uh, the deceased in this case. So. Um, we're going to continue on, and Lee Jr. gets indicted by a grand jury. This is on October 20th of 2003 uh, on the charge of second-degree murder in the death of Audra Bland. And, and second-degree, Woody? It, it's, it's, it means pure, what? pure life, second-degree murder, because there's no aggravating circumstance. I mean, if, if I kill you— that, um, and it's not during a commission of a robbery or rape or something like that, then it's second-degree murder. Interesting. So the defendant uh, at the trial, he doesn't testify, but the defense presented testimony from a Georgia Bureau of Investigations Coastal Crime Laboratory medical examiner by the name of Edmund Donahue. And remember what I just told you. The nail in the coffin here was the medical examiner's uh, report, in, in my opinion. Right. He he is laying yeah. out that this is a fight. So if you're the defense, you've got to counteract that probably more than anything else. Right. And so Dr. Donahue, he didn't feel that the abrasions on the victim's lips, nose, cheek, neck, and face indicated that she had been smothered or choked. Uh, according to Dr. Donahue, the injuries were most likely caused by the efforts to resuscitate the victim. Mm-hmm. He also opined that the victim's cause of death was an epidural hematoma due to a fracture of the left uh, occipital bone of the skull due to a fall on the back of her head, which would line up with what the defendant had said. Uh, Dr. Donahue also claimed it was impossible for a pathologist to tell from the injury to the victim's frontal lobes whether she had fallen accidentally or whether she had been pushed because the injuries would look exactly the same. Hmm. So based on the review of records provided to him by the defense, Dr. Donahue indicated it was most likely that after the victim fell, she was carried up to the third floor of the house. It had a small elevator, y'all, um, and thereafter was taken out of bed and bathed. He stated that uh, that would present an opportunity to bump the victim's head if she were unconscious. So you're carrying someone, they're unconscious, you're right. struggling to get them, you know, it's dead weight, right? right? And so you're struggling to get them in a bathtub, and maybe you hit their head. Um, Dr. Donahue also said uh, he was confident that the victim died of a fall on the back of the head and not from blows during an altercation. Now, what do you think the prosecution does? They stand up, and the first question they ask is, so are you getting paid? Exactly. (laughs) This happens in every case. How many cases? I mean, they found this guy in Georgia. He's coming to St. Tammany Parish. Yeah, expert witness, if you will. Right. Um, and he concedes that when asked if he was being compensated by the defense, uh, that he was getting paid four hundred fifty dollars per hour or a flat rate of five thousand dollars per day. Yeah, that doesn't suck. So what they're trying to do? No, that don't. <laughs> and what they're trying to do there is totally take all the credibility away right. from his testimony because right. what, what he's to... saying completely right. is. Right. And 180, 360 degrees from what the other medical and, examiner and said. I've spent to you, that's what he's paid to do, y'all. And, and I've seen it so many times. Of a, this leads, it's like you said, Lee's family must have had some money because um, to hire, hire this expert is, is, it's not just a day he shows up to trial. He's got to study it and everything else and be interviewed and, and deposed and all that. But anyway, many witnesses were called in. Um, including everyone we just told you about. And they spoke of the fact of the case 
that we just told you. All, everything was just presented to you. So in 2007, William Wayne Lee Jr. was found guilty of second-degree murder in, for the murder of, of uh, Audra Bland and was sentenced to life in prison with no parole inside the wire of Bloody Angola. And y'all, life means life in Louisiana. So, y'all, now, you may think that, uh, you know, we've really gotten into this story, but you ain't heard nothing yet. Crazy. This has more twists and turns than, uh, the, you know, a roller coaster. It's, it's crazy. Uh, the case has set actually quite the precedent that you're going to have to hear to believe and eventually made its way all the way up to the Louisiana Supreme Court. In the next episode, which incidentally we're going to release on Tuesday because right. Thursday is Thanksgiving. Turkey Day. Turkey Day. Right. So look, Tuesday of next week, uh, you're going to have a double dose of Real Life Real Crime Original and Bloody Angola. Exactly. So you got to listen to both, right? Double that up. That's it. We're going to light it up. And uh, and so look for that. That's due to the Thanksgiving holiday. And we're gonna, what we're going to do, look, every case, every case where there's a life sentence, uh, you know, imposed, what happens is you can bet the appeals are going to start yeah, coming. Absolutely. That's just the beginning. Everybody appeals themselves out and, and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, this is nothing no to different. lose when you're sitting in jail. Nothing yeah. to lose. And you got nothing but time right. to, you right. know, probably your best lawyers are sitting behind right. bars. Right. Be, lawyers. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got nothing but time to focus on this stuff. So in the next episode, uh, we're going to bring you inside the court during that appeal. We're going to cover the arguments made by the defense. And it's going to be kind of a fun episode because the way that we're going to do it is we're going to cover those arguments, and then I'm going to get Woody's opinion on each one of them. Right. And he's going to give his uh, bloodline lawyer right. opinion right. Um, on what whether he feels it's you know accurate, not accurate. And we want y'all, we encourage y'all to comment on Facebook of uh, right. your feelings on Dime these in, arguments. It, it's going to be um, super entertaining. Super right. entertaining. And then there's an epic, what I would classify as an epic conclusion to this series where we're having a special guest come on the show and they're going to let's just say they had kind of a courtside seat almost yeah. to this historic ruling so yeah. it's about to get to the real case, to the case good. and the ruling right yeah the case that's right and uh and so it's about to get real good a, a couple things we want to mention um, first of all, to shout out to HelloFresh, our sponsor. Right. Thank you, HelloFresh. Uh, yeah, ride food. or dies for us. Right. right. And you know why? Because y'all keep buying it. And the That's right. Y'all, why you keep buying it? Because it's that good. Because it's that good. It's that convenient. Right? And it's that cost effective. Love. Yeah. Yeah. And they just they just renewed with us for an entire year. So right. the, the HelloFresh and, and uh, Bloody and Gold, a great relationship. And look, HelloFresh.com slash Bloody Angola free. Right. right now, Woody Everton, free breakfast for life. That's love. For life. For life. Never going to pay for breakfast yeah, again, y'all. Yeah, I pay like 8 or $9 a morning for mine. That's yeah, it. it is. Yeah, so you use the code. Uh, uh, Bloody Angola free. And then look, I, I, you know, when you cook something, post it on social media. I mean, I'd like to see it. Yeah, we'd love to see that. And speaking of that, uh, we we are look. You know, we're covering. What do we talk about here? We talk about cases, and we talk about people sitting inside Bloody Angola and a history of Bloody Angola. And if you're a law firm and you're looking to uh, get, you know, your law firm out there to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Right. Uh, shoot us a message. Yeah, especially yeah, we're looking for a local law right. firm to sponsor right. uh, Bloody Angola. We think for that would make a great real. fit for what we talk about, right? Absolutely, and get a direct audience. That's right, and and so look for that. Look for this next episode, and also uh, before we get out of here, real life, real crime daily, uh, which is something we do together with Mike Agavino. Right now, we're uh, Mondays. Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, four days right, a week. Right. We talk about current crime, current crime all the time, all the time, <laughs> different, different segments and everything else. And y'all go check that show out also. And real life, real crime originals drop on Tuesday also. And um, yeah, so go go check it out if you hadn't listened to it in 
Love and appreciate y'all. That's right. And uh, shorter episode today, but okay. next next episode might be a little longer. Right, so right. Uh, so look for that. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. Your host of Bloody and Gola. A podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Peace. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, Goose and Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hillstring Gang, Wrangle the Three.